I'm not mad, I'm just disappointed. Rewind to the early 2000s. A teenage me had come across this unknown PlayStation game called Galarians, which, in tone and style, was exactly what I needed at the time. I don't remember how I found it. Possibly on a pocket money friendly clearance rack, maybe something my mum brought home for me. I just know I'm incredibly glad I did play it. Fast forward a few years, I'm in race CDs, now known as Beatniks in Norwich, flicking through their used games when I see this. Galarian's Ash. My mind starts racing. There was a sequel? No one told me about this. Has this ever even been in magazines? I have to have it. I think it was ridiculously cheap too, maybe a fiver at most. I slapped my money down, ran back to my dad's house, sneakily plugged the PS2 into the living room TV, popped the disc in and started playing what I was sure would be one of my favourite games of all time. Spoiler alert, Galarian's Ash did not become one of my favourite games of all time. In fact, it is one of the first things I think of when I hear the terms buyer's remorse or unnecessary sequel. How did they get you so wrong? Galarian's Ash is one of those follow-ups that completely reinvents itself instead of refining and iterating on what came before. The tank controls, fixed camera angles, pre-rendered backgrounds, and general feel of the original game had been replaced by the at the time more modern sensibilities of fully 3D environments, analog movement, and a third person camera. You now had a base of operations that you spend far too much time in, complete with other people to speak to, light RPG elements, and a box quote promising psychic battles at 60 FPS. This was as far removed from more of the same as it could get, but modernization isn't necessarily a bad thing, and even I have to admit there are several areas where Ash improves the first game's formula. For example, there's greater enemy variety with some striking designs that really stand out. There, I said something nice about the game, and I really want you to remember that as we continue. Sadly, the game also excels at misdirection and wasting the player's time. Take this scenario where I'm back at the same base for the third time now. I have to activate a backup computer. That's fine, I know where that is, I've been in that room several times before. I go all the way downstairs, beat up the enemies, and find the doors locked. Of course it is, this is a trick Galarian's Ash pulls far too often to pad itself. I'm kinda desensitized to it at this point, so I check my map and pop back upstairs to find a way around through the armory. Now I can actually access the room with the backup computer, but it needs a startup key. Ugh! That's fine, there's an activity log on a screen at the other end of the room saying the last person to access it was an Air Beagle pilot. No doubt they'll have the startup key, and the plots only introduce me to one pilot, Patty, so I just need to head back to their hangar. Oh, Pat's hiding in their air beagle and won't come out. Maybe if I kill these enemies on the path leading to the hangar? I mean, that was the solution when I had this exact same problem with a different NPC about half an hour ago. Huh. No, that, uh, that does not change anything. Turns out, and you'll love this part, the air beagle pilot is a random NPC in the sick bay two stories up that I've never met or had my attention drawn to in any way, shape, or form before now. Oh, and he doesn't even have the startup key on him. He left it in his air beagle in a different hangar, but he can give me the key to that hangar door, so it's all right. Now, when I get there, the beagle parked up isn't the right one! I have to use a switch to rotate in a different air beagle to then get the startup key before having to backtrack all the way to the stupid backup computer again! And you cannot skip or shorten this sequence in any way, shape, or form. If you try to go straight to the pilot, you will not get the right dialogue and you will not get the key because you have not been to the backup computer and you have not read that activity log. Now that might be excusable if it was a one-off instance of bad game design in an otherwise okay title, but this isn't an isolated incident, far from it. The entire game is like this. It's purposefully obtuse, padded, and frustrating. 
Even on a macro level, Galarian's Ash has a serious problem with recycling and repeating content. You'll start the game in the Mushroom Tower, after a boss fight that's surprisingly full on for the first boss of the game, you repeat the exact same tower with some minor differences for plot reasons. The game's very much starting as it means to go on here. You'll then find yourself in your home base being sent back and forth between the same areas for a good while before eventually leaving for a uranium plant where, to its credit, the game picks up considerably. No, seriously, there's a halfway decent albeit basic puzzle throughout, new enemies, environmental hazards, and I genuinely started feeling something resembling fun here. Now that's two nice things I've said about the game, and I really do want you to keep count. Please remember that I did say something nice about this game. Regrettably, you're then back at base, back to the Mushroom Tower, back at base again, and then it's a third trip to the goddamn Mushroom Tower! I don't know what comes next because that's where I'd had enough and put the game down, but I'd assume back to base yet again, and these aren't short segments folks, oh no, they are long and tedious and massively outstay their welcome. For comparison, in the original game, you visited an area once before moving on to the next. There was a fairly linear structure with limited backtracking and decent overall pacing. Each room was custom made, bespoke, and generally served a purpose with the exception of the hotel's identikit rooms. The environments felt lived in, it was easy to find landmarks for navigation, and most screens oozed detail and thoughtful little touches. The sequel does away with all of that! Nothing can be that intricate or carefully crafted because all rooms are multi-purpose for repeat visits now. The environments are uninteresting and unfocused. Where the first game had a very keen sense of style and aesthetic, the sequel just looks like any other PS2 era game with metal corridors. It's copying Metal Gear Solid 2's homework and not even being subtle about it. Now it's not just the return visits necessitating this homogenous design choice. They're all large, open, featureless, empty, bland spaces because at some point they'll have to be used as a combat arena. All of these rooms have to service a focus on the brand new battle system. Let's be honest, this is probably for the best, the first game's battle system wasn't exactly intuitive and sometimes it didn't even work. Galarian's Ash does provide an objective improvement, see I said a third nice thing, and in theory, I like what it's going for. In practice though, oh god in practice, it just falls apart. Movement has been entirely changed. Tank controls and fixed camera angles are nowhere in sight, and you now have a lock-on that will feel very familiar to anyone who's played a little game called, oh I don't know, the Ocarina of Time. I could have sworn Nintendo patented said targeting. Anyway, this implementation is finicky at best. You lose it if the enemy moves even a millimetre outside of its pitifully short range, it breaks if you dodge roll, another new move that expands Rion's agility and was a good idea, there that's a fourth nice thing, and it's utterly useless against bosses who love to teleport or quickly duck in and out of the arena. It's clear the game wanted to have a more action focused, reaction based combat system, and these control options do go a good way to providing that, until you remember your powers, your only means of attack, still need to be charged before firing. That leaves you as a sitting duck and prevents the combat from ever having its desired flow. Speaking of your powers, the game's previous abilities all return. Naokon is your basic projectile attack. It's suitable for most encounters, but don't expect big damage. Red still sends flames flying, only now it's been upgraded to hit multiple targets. That's great, but it makes your previous crowd control ability, D Felon's Levitation, kind of redundant. Especially before you level it up the first time. The attack is effectively useless when you first get it. There are two new powers, but I only unlocked one of them during my time with the game. A scientist handed it over some three and a half hours in, which is probably about halfway through the story. It suffers the same fate as D. Felon did in the previous title. Too little, too late, 
especially when my existing power set had already been leveled up. In the first outing, Skip was a rare tablet that powered up all of your abilities at the same time. You could even stack two of them to get Rion to the maximum of level 3, but he'd drop back down again if his health got to 50% or lower. The sequel changes things for the better. Skip's now a permanent upgrade, but it's used on one power at a time. You have to decide where to spend it, and I much prefer this. See, I am looking for the positives here. I really don't want to hate this game. Most skips will be obtained through story events and are pretty hard to miss, but there are secret skips hidden in the game. For example, defeating every enemy in this room will grant you one. Getting them all is seemingly the only way to max out Rion's powers in a single run, and that could provide a great incentive for exploration or otherwise going above and beyond if the game made any effort to telegraph them or clue you into their existence. Damn it, they were so close to doing something actually interesting! Speaking of previously rare drugs that have become more common here, we have Apolinar. Apolinar induces a short. This is where Rion's powers go haywire. Everything around him dies pretty much instantly, but his movement speed is greatly reduced and he constantly loses health. Purposefully shorting is a tactical decision which was underutilized in the first game, where there was only one Apolinar tablet during the entire playthrough. While I always seem to have a couple on hand this time, they were rendered useless by how easy it is to purposely induce a short without them. Rion still got an AP gauge, you still short when that gauge fills up, and you still need to take Delmeter to stop a short before it kills you. The gauge now fills at a much faster rate when charging your powers, and absolutely skyrockets if you pull out your new shield ability. I got through multiple tricky encounters by just blocking all attacks with my shield, which inevitably made me short, killing my opponents for me. Combine this with the added RPG elements and you can grind yourself to godhood pretty easily. See those numbers next to all of my gauges? Well, when enemies die, they leave items like plus 10 HP or plus 20 max red. These are permanent upgrades. Enemies constantly respawn, they drop recovery pills, power top-ups, and Delmeter, so you don't have to sweat resource management, and there are glowing green orbs in set locations that provide an instant full heal. You can outright abuse this system to get ridiculously powerful. As you'd imagine, the difficulty balancing is kind of all over the place in this one. I was chomping through recovery pills like they were a packet of refreshers during the game's first boss fight. I mean, seriously, what even is this? And I took a lot of deaths early on that caused me to repeat several areas. You know, more than the plot already makes me do anyway. As the game continued though, I soon felt untouchable. I even realized a lot of the boss's attacks could be avoided by simply standing still. What you're seeing now is a battle around three hours in against the main antagonist. You're supposed to just barely survive, the narrative theming being explicitly, Ash is far too strong, we can't even hope to defeat him as we are. I brought the fight to an early close because I did too much damage to Ash by simply throwing up a shield during his area of effect barrage, then countering with Nalcom blasts after. There was no tension, and I categorically did not fear this guy like I was supposed to. If a protagonist is only as good as the villain he's up against, then I think I know why I didn't connect with this game's story or stakes. Not only did I not finish the game because the core gameplay loop wasn't compelling or engaging, I didn't even bother reading a plot synopsis or YouTubing the remaining cutscenes to see how the rest of the tale played out, for the simple reason that I frankly didn't care. Ash is an awful villain. This story can only exist by retconning the original game, and I sort of have to go into major spoiler territory for both titles to explain why. I'll pop a timer on screen now so you can skip ahead if you want to miss out on me shortening my own lifespan by getting overly wound up about this. We good? Okay! The first game centered around an evil computer named Dorothy that was trying to rule over mankind. Fine. Dorothy's creators, Drs. Steiner and Pascal, who for some reason are pronounced as Steiner and Pascali in this sequel, created a virus program that would destroy Dorothy. 
They use their own kids for this, kind of weird, embedding the virus program in Rion's brain and the activation program in Lilia's. Galarian's 1 was all about an amnesiac 14-year-old Rion discovering this and reuniting with Lilia before finally injecting Dorothy with the virus. Sadly, and this is important, Rion died in the process. I'm leaving out a pretty major spoiler and, in my opinion, gaping plot hole you can still discover for yourself, but those are the main things you need to know about the first game. Now, how can we have a sequel if the main character and enemy are already dead? By making those deaths borderline meaningless, of course! Dorothy had a failsafe program. She activated more of her psychic-powered humanoid warriors, the titular Galarians, who started a recovery process using backup data. That makes sense. That's feasible. That's plausible. This doesn't cause me any issues. I'm okay with this so far. What about our hero, though? Who are we going to play as if Rion's dead? Is this a new protagonist? Maybe one of those new Galarians goes rogue? That could be kind of interesting, right? Here's what we got instead. In that backup data, a now 20-year-old Lilia somehow finds Rion's consciousness. No, I don't know how it got from Rion's corpse to the backup data, but she's somehow able to communicate with him and return his digital consciousness to his real-world body, which she's creepily preserved for six years. A body which has somehow continued to grow and mature despite, you know, being clinically dead with no brain functions. Are you starting to see the problem yet? That is, assuming what she brought back even is Rion. The Rion I knew was an anguished and traumatized 14-year-old with powers he couldn't explain and a world-saving burden he had to come to terms with. This new Rion is some overly confident action hero badass spitting out one-liners like this. Are you afraid to fight me on your own? You always send your robots to deal with me first, huh? Rion, be careful. I'm coming back. You can bet on it. Even you'll be up the creek if you get too close. It's just a matter of who dies first. So, I'm scum, huh? Look who's talking. Just wait till I stick this virus down your throat. Yeah, that ain't my guy. Maybe I've clocked onto something that's a major reveal later on, I didn't stick around to find out, but giving the game the benefit of the doubt would be affording it too much credit based on my experience so far. Genuinely, they may as well have just gone with a new protagonist. At any rate, it's now a race to prevent Ash from restoring Dorothy and destroying mankind. Thing is, it's crystal clear Ash is just playing with his food. He's a living reactor with control over a highly irradiated uranium factory who could end this at any time. He outright beats Rion and lets him live, with even his own lieutenants asking what the hell the deal is. I don't find this David Bowie wannabe the least bit compelling or intimidating. Maybe he had his reasons. I don't know. Finding out wasn't enough incentive to keep playing this awful game. Let me be crystal clear here. I wanted so badly to love this game. I really did. The original meant so much to me, and to know that there was more out there, that that world got to continue, and that there was something else in store? That genuinely excited me in ways I rarely get hyped up. That's probably why what was delivered was so crushingly disappointing. If I didn't have that connection to the original, I would be calling this a 5 out of 10, 6 out of 10, mediocre game that just isn't worth your time. But that's not the position I'm in. I just keep coming back to the same problem. Everything I loved about the first game, the aesthetics, the concept, the atmosphere, the plot, world building and characters, it's either absent or tainted beyond recognition in this hollow, vapid, meaningless sequel which had no reason to exist. I say that despite the fact I generally disagree with the idea that any media shouldn't or doesn't deserve to exist. Even if something's not to my taste, there'll probably be someone out there who loves it. I just don't know who Galarian's Ash is for or what the developers' motivations for making it were. The plot had a definitive conclusion they had to actively undo to even make this sequel. They completely changed the genre and gameplay. It's not like the original even sold all that well. Who was 
was asking for this! Who? I hate to give up on a game midway through, especially when I'm making a video about it, but I did give up on Galarian's Ash. Twice even! Once as a teenager and again as an adult, mostly for the same reasons both times. In a way, knowing Galarian's Ash exists and is canonical spoils the original game for me in a similar way to how learning about Mel Gibson's private life tainted Mad Max and Lethal Weapon. It hits especially hard because Galarian's was MY game! It was MY hidden gem! It was MY obscure recommendation that strongly spoke to MY tastes and sensibilities! You know what? No, I take it back! I am mad! I am mad, but I am mostly so horribly, frustratingly disappointed! So, let me just be completely honest with you, this is not entirely the video I wanted to make. I was really hoping that when I put this game down as a teenager, when it didn't click with me, that I was just immature, or that I was missing something, and that coming back to it as an adult, I might see it in a new light, that my tastes might have changed or evolved, and that I would see something I didn't before, and finally be able to enjoy this sequel to what is a game I hold very dear to me. Sadly, that wasn't the case, and while I don't think this game is irredeemable, it certainly isn't good, and I really struggled to find things that I liked about it. And I think one of the reasons this video has taken me longer to make than usual is because I had to be honest with myself about my own thoughts and emotions surrounding this game, and that was difficult. That was really hard. I really, really hope I don't get disappointed like this again. With all the Sonic 30th news that's happening right now, just, you know, to date the video, because why not? I am terrified for what we might get from Sega, because, you know, all the voice actors are leaving and such. This is categorically the poster child for making a game for all of the wrong reasons. And I hope I never play something this crushing and soul-destroying again. At any rate, I would like to thank you for sitting through uh, what has probably been a good 20 minutes of me losing my goddamn mind. I'd like to give a shout out to Chuckleson, my one Patreon, who uh, does support the show financially. Thank you very much. I am going to need a palate cleanser. The next video might not be one from the schedule. I might need something that uh, I know for definite will give me a boost. I want some dopamine. And I'm sorry to leave this video on a sour note, but I do hope that I will see you in the next one.